Uh, today I'm going to present a uh, case of Mr. X Y Z, who's 72 year old, who had a uh, formal education up to 12th standard, who was a goldsmith by occupation, uh, retired 30 years ago, who's a resident of Bangalore, right-handed individual, informant being self and his son. He presented to us with complaints of weakness and stiffness in both lower limbs since 25 days, weakness and stiffness in both the upper limbs since 15 days, numbness in both lower limbs and upper limbs since 15 days, and neck pain since 15 days. Coming to the history of presenting illness. Yes. This is it. The patient was in his usual state of health one month ago when he developed weakness in the right lower limb for 50, uh, 25 days back such that initially the patient had difficulty in standing up from the edge uh, standing up from the edge of the bed getting up from squatting position and the weakness gradually progressed such that he had difficulty in gripping slippers eventually initially the patient had no difficulty in walking and the weakness uh, progressed over the past uh, 25 days to one month such that uh, he uh, he uses walker or the help of his relatives uh, to walk after he developed the weakness in the uh, uh, right lower limb after another two to three days the patient had a weakness in the right lower limb such that he uh, developed weakness uh, i mean he developed weakness in the left lower limb and the weakness progressed in a similar way uh, as it progressed in the right lower limb that is initially he developed weakness of the uh, proximal aspect and then uh, the distal aspect of the limb the patient also gives history of stiffness of both the lower limbs since 20 days. Uh, currently, over the uh, currently, the weakness has progressed as the patient has been uh, bedridden. At this point, when he developed weakness of both the uh, lower limbs, he had no similar complaints in the upper limbs. That is around 25 days back. Patients associated with stiffness since the past 15 days, such that initially he had difficulty in mixing food and there was slippage of food between the fingers when he used to hold the food, which made him to use spoon. However, currently the patient is unable to hold the spoon as well and is being fed by the attenders. He also gives history of difficulty in holding objects. However, he has no difficulty to reach out overhead objects. Patient also gives history of difficulty in rolling side to side on the cot and difficulty to sit from supine position since the past 15 days. There was no history of twitching, no history of thinning of the limbs and no history of any involuntary movements. The patient also complains of numbness in both upper and lower limbs since the 15, since, uh, past 15 days. Patient also gives history of neck pain since the past 15 days, sharp shooting type of pain which exaggerates and flicks. The exaggerates on flexion of the neck and uh, ra uh, radiates to both the upper limbs and there were no uh, relieving factors. The pain has been increasing in frequency over the past uh, one week. The patient does not give any history of loss of hot or cold sensation. There's no history of tingling or pins and needle sensation. There's no history of uh, swaying while walking prior to this uh, symptoms. There's no history of altered sensorium, uh, loss of consciousness, headache, seizures or any vomiting. There's no history of loss of smell. No history of blooding of vision or double vision. I'll continue, ma'am. Yes, yes, I am hearing. I am able to hear. But some external noise is there. I don't know where it is coming. No problem. I yeah. can hear. No history of loss of sensation over the face. No history of difficulty in chewing. No history of deviation of angle of mouth. There's no history of hearing loss, tinnitus or vertigo. There's no history of difficulty in uh, swallowing. There's no difficulty in uh, uh, speech. There's no history of bowel or bladder disturbances. There's no history of palpitations, syncope, abnormal sweating. There's no history of any backache. No history of loss of appetite or loss of weight. No history of fever, joint pain or rashes. There's no history of recent vaccination. There's no history of exposure to toxins in the, re uh, in the recent past. There's no history of any high-risk behavior. Past history, the patient had history of blood transfusion in June 2022. There were two pins of blood that was transfused, but however, the details are not known. The patient had history of hemorrhoids six years ago for which he was operated. Uh, the, uh, there's no history of any other comorbidities. There's no ex ex uh, history of exposure to TB in the past.
family history there is nothing contributory the patient consumes a mixed diet appetite being uh, good the sleep has been disturbed due to the pain uh, bowel and bladder habits are regular there is no high risk behavior uh, so coming to the uh, summary uh, elderly right now has he any bladder or bowel involvement now right no, now no. he's he's been catheterized after after admission to the hospital because he is unable to uh, mobilize other than that prior to hospitalization he does not give any history of uh, bladder involvement okay sensations uh, sensation ma'am he gives history of numbness but he does not give any history of loss of uh, loss of sensation or uh, numbness is up to where numbness up to where Numbness, he says, both upper limbs and uh, lower limbs, ma'am. Uh, okay. uh, whole of the lower limbs and upper limbs. Okay. So summary, uh, summarize. Then we will discuss. So elderly gentleman with no known comorbidities uh, presented with uh, subacute onset uh, symmetry, gradually progressive weakness of the lower limbs, uh, followed by upper limb weakness, associated with stiffness of all four limbs. numbness in all four limbs and neck pain with uh, no symptoms suggestive of cranial nerve involvement bowel or bladder involvement and no autonomic symptoms why did he have this blood transfusion what was the cause for his need was it due to these hemorrhoids no ma'am hemorrhoids they said he was operated around 6 years back recently he did not have any history of blood in stools or uh, uh, any other uh, uh, history of any malina but it was not evaluated which was another outside hospital there were no details that was available cause of the anemia is not known hmm? okay. okay so we will start now apparently you said that your patient's illness started slightly asymmetrically yes ma'am less than 25 days yes maybe 10 days onset to peak is 10 days lower limb to upper limb So it's fairly acute only. Yes. It is ten uh, days disease. It started with the right lower limb. So in the right lower limb, you you said that he had a difficulty in getting up from the side of the cot yes. and getting up from the floor. But the distal parts were okay. Distal part? Yes, ma'am. Initially it was okay. Gradually he started. In, I mean, over the past few days, even the distal involvement also was there. Yeah, he, he had uh, difficulty even in gripping the chappal also. Okay. Gradually, so something starts proximally. Uh, what are the things that will? It's a motor problem. Motor problem. Yes. Apparently proximal. Apparently we don't know, but it is the patient complaint whether anything else restrained him, whether pain or anything. All those things we don't know. But if it is apparently a proximal weakness, the, at that time I am sure he did not have any pain over the back or hip or anything like that. So it is not due to a non-neurological uh, problem, I suppose. No. No, ma'am. So because my teacher always used to tell, no more than knowing neurology, always you should know what is not neurology. So everything that the patient tells, because it is a neurology presentation, we should not think it is neurology. What is not neurology, we should know. So we should always mention whether there was a pain, seventy-two-year-old person, no, whether he was unable proximal. Asymmetrical, no. Proximal means it is it can be L M N or M N. So apparently proximal motor asymmetrical. So whether it is L M N or M N, L M N, it may be at the level of roots, acute Guillain-Barré like syndromes, radicular neuropathies. They are proximal weakness. It's only ten days, so it's not qualifying for a chronic condition. So it's a fairly acute condition. So one, it could be roots. Second, it could be plexus. Third, it could be muscles. But uh, muscles uh, coming asymmetrically is very very unusual. Even if it is inflammatory muscle disease, it is fairly symmetrical. But the asymmetry is very short period. I think it is only few days. Till at that point of time, it was asymmetrical. And third, uh, it may be upper motor neuron. In upper motor neuron, typically movement paralysis will affect the fine movements. So it is not due to movement paralysis. If upper motor neuron disorder is presenting with a proximal difficulty, it is not due to movement paralysis. We always tell 
lower motor neuron disease, it is muscle paralysis, whereas upper motor neuron disease, movement paralysis. And movement paralysis means fine movements need most coordinated uh, uh, recruitment of agonist, antagonist, synergist, and fixed up. So that is most important for the finest movement. So it will be the distal movement. If it is lower limb, if it is due to weakness, it is due to, it will be distal. But if it is due to stiffness, it will be proximal. So these are the, so when somebody starts with a pier motor syndrome, which is asymmetrical and proximal, we will think LMN weakness or EMN stiffness. EMN weakness will not present with the proximal weakness. EMN weakness is a fine moment paralysis, so it will be distal only. So whether it is a stiffness, that is manifesting as difficulty in getting up. What is the relevance? You see, supposing your power is good, it is having relevance, not at this patient, because he progressed to complete weakness, mm -hmm. but otherwise, somebody may be terribly disabled with a fairly good power, and stiffness is the one which is hampering. Then antispasticity drugs will be very useful, whatever may be the condition. But if it is the weakness that is paralyzing the patient, Tone is beneficial. So some degree of tone is there, you can still stand on your tone. Even if the power is about one or two, if you are stiff, you can stand. If you are full, you cannot stand. So for a weak person with an upper motor neuron disease, you should not treat spasticity. If you treat spasticity, patient is standing on his tone. You knock up the tone also, it become bedridden. But if the person's power is good and he is immobilized due to stiffness, such a patient, you treat the stiffness, he will benefit. So that is the relevance. So in this situation, if it is upper motor neuron, it is stiffness. And if it is lower motor neuron, it is roots or plexus or uh, uh, muscle, where muscle is uh, least yeah, because it is asymmetrical. So this will be the possibility we are considering. And always we tell PR motor means it is, uh, if it is the roots are large myelinated, if it is the tract also large myelinated. So whether it is due to stiffness, it's a large myelinated, fibers are getting involved. So be careful, maybe myelin is the culprit which is getting affected. And if it is element also, it's a large myelinated fiber. So motor fibers are large myelinated fiber. At that point of time, you are having a, uh, flu like that. So supposing it is stiffness at this point, coming to one leg and you are putting it in the upper motor neuron, what are all the areas you would like to consider? That is the next question. So it can be in the spinal cord at that point. At that point, it is a monoparesis. It's a monoparesis. If the person has come to you at a time when only one leg was weak, so it is apparently a monoparesis. These are situations where uh, brain, cerebral paraplegias may be mistaken as spinal paraplegias and vice versa. And in a resource restricted patient who cannot afford brain and spine imaging and all those things, you may have to decide which part you are going to image for a diagnosis. So it's a monoparesis, motor monoparesis. If it was the stiffness, and then what are the areas you are going to consider? One is in the spinal cord, lamination. I'm sure you know there is something called lamination. And in the post corticospinal tract, lower limb fibers are outer. Upper limb and cervical are inner. Mm -hmm. So supposing this spasticity is due to an upper motor neuron in the spinal cord, then it is... Whatever is the pathology is starting from the outermost aspect because the lamination for the leg is outermost. So that is one localization in the spinal cord. Or it may be a central lesion, then it should be in the inner hemispheric region. The leg area is in the inner hemispheric region. So let us, for theory's sake, try to differentiate cerebral paraplegia from spinal paraplegia. Very important, I told uh, most of the time when the persons are in the government sector, they are poor people, so you should be careful. So how to differentiate cerebral paraplegia from spinal paraplegia? 
because it is monoparis, always monoparis is thing of cortical. I'm sure you are a postgraduate and I'm sure monoparis is thing of a cortical monoparis. We use it <coughs> like that. So how to differentiate? One thing, cerebral paraplegia, there may be alteration in the sensorium. Patient may be slightly drowsy, disoriented. There may be features of raised intracranial pressure. There can be seizures, focal seizures in the lower limbs. Fourth, there can be cortical sensory loss in the lower limb. And fifth point, you can have a cortical type of bladder. And patient may show frontal lobe behavior. He may look dis-executive, depressed. Uh, all the uh, frontal, other frontal behaviors may be seen. So if it is a cerebral paraplegia, the point is, one is the weakness uh, may be associated with seizures. That is the most important clue. If seizure is there, you are very lucky. Equivalent of the seizure in the spinal cord is clonus. So how are you going to differentiate a seizure from the clonus? Clonus always comes when stretched. So a person with a monoparesis, either he apply a strength or patient tries to stand. from Nimhans. Which one? What is that? Somebody is talking in between, I think so. No? Is it so? Am I audible? You are yes. audible, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So when you press your feet or by the patient by an attempt to stand or use press it, clonus will come. Whereas seizures are spontaneous. Second, seizures are intermittent. They come and go. Whereas clonus will come whenever you press it or whenever the patient tries to stand, clonus will come. Next point, frontal behavioral changes are never seen in spinal pathology except patient may be depressed because of the disease. Then third, what is the sensation? If it is due to spinal, you may have posterior column or spinal thalamic depending on the structures that are involved in the spinal cord. Uh, it may be hemisectioning, so you may have yes, one leg, you are expecting a partial hemisectioning going on. So it will be posterior column on the same side, spinal thalamic on the opposite side, bronze cord like phenomena. So you may expect when it is a spinal monoparesis. In a spinal monoparesis, you can you should look for whether the patient is telling or not. You look for opposite spinal thalamic and it's the lateral posterior column. Whereas in cerebral paraplegia, you look for cortical sensory loss because what are common colors? <laughs> So it will be cortical sensory loss in the lower limb, whereas uh, in the spinal cord, we said it may brown sick cord like. And a third phenomenon, uh, very interesting thing I, I, in the homunculus, between the motor homunculus and the sensory homunculus. You know that the motor homunculus, the leg is below represented from the hip itself in the inner hemispheric fissure, whereas sensory part, it is below the knee only. So it can be terribly misleading. You will think something like subacute combined degeneration. This person has received some blood transfusion. So did he have a megaloblastic anemia? And is he having subacute combined degeneration? Yes, it will be paraparesis below the L1 or whatever level you are getting. And sensory will be below knee. <laughs> because in the inner hemispheric fissure, the homunculus is very interesting. The sensory part is below the knee, not below the hip. You can go back and so it will produce a pseudo appearance of a peripheral nerve. Unless you start examining and eliminate the reflexes, then you will know that the reflexes are exaggerated. Otherwise, sensory symptom will be below the knee. So cerebral paraplegia, there is a misleading red herring that the sensation will be below the knee. And in a oh, context of okay. patient oh, yes. has factory anemia or whatever, and he need a transfusion, uh, we may be tempted to think of a uh, nutritional condition like subacute combined degeneration. Acute presentations are known in B12. And uh, they can have frontal lobe behavior, encephalopathies. All these can happen. 
So we may mistake like that. Always remember this sensory loss. Then as I said, the bladder will be a frontal bladder. What is a frontal bladder? It's an uninhibited bladder. So patient will pass urine anywhere he likes. But if you do the bladder comply, pre-voiding phase is all right. Voiding is all right. He can void completely. There is no residual urine. Only thing, the social cognition is not there. So he will pass urine in socially forbidden areas. Whereas spinal bladder, if it is a upper motor neuron, you get generally, if it is a complete uh, cord lesion, you get an automatic bladder. What is an automatic bladder? Automatic bladder will be pre-voiding phase, partial or complete loss of appreciation. Automatically, when the bladder fills about 500 ml, it will start emptying. Patient cannot control the midstream. Even if he wants to stop, it will empty that much amount. And at the end of emptying, there will be residual urine that results in post voiding dribbling. So in the pre-voiding phase, patient has partial or complete impairment of uh, sensation of fullness and pain. He cannot initiate maturation voluntarily. It automatically happens and automatically empties about 300 to 400 ml of urine. In the midstream, he cannot stop the maturation. At the end of maturation, there is residual urine and there is post voiding dribbling. That is automatic bladder. So frontal bladder is different. Spinal bladder is different. So these are the points. So now we have a monoparesis. If it is upper motor neuron, whether it is in the spinal cord or uh, frontal uh, cerebral paraplegia, is a question we should always ask. At that point, later you got neck pain, larmids, and so many things. But initially, all those things were not there. So we have to uh, analyze this, utilize this opportunity to differentiate between cerebral paraplegia and the spinal paraplegia. So that is the localization for that monoparesis. But soon the patient developed weakness of the opposite loyalty. Mm -hmm. In a similar fashion. So opposite side also, it is the tone that got altered. That, I, that side also, you said it is proximal. Yes, so proximal. it was probably the tone that got, got altered. And uh, so little uh, unusual about this condition. So what, what is unusual? Commonly, you have got tone, you have got power. Two things are there. But the tone gets altered generally in degenerative conditions. Not in short duration acute conditions. Like, suppose you have got hereditary spastic paraplegia, tropical spastic paraplegia. There, the tone is the one which gets altered. Whereas in acute condition, it is weakness. So in this patient, something is very odd that it is the tone that got altered or the way he gave the history was like that or what, we do not know. At that point, at this point, we will believe this, but take it as an odd point. So, and here, after the right loyal limb, it is the left loyal limb that got involved. That means, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the inference? It looks like a tractopathy. So if it is a... Uh, uh, corticospinal tract, it is pairing the tracts in between and picking up the corticospinal tract on right side if it is upper motor neuron and then going to the outer corticospinal tract on the opposite side. So this is also an odd feature, generally sparing many of the uh, structures in between. So uh, acute tractopathy. So acute tractopathy may be demyelination. Second point is you can have an intradural pathology, like a compressive pathology. Suppose you got an intradural neurofibroma or meningioma, which was very quiet for some time, and the acute presentation can be due to a hemorrhage. A hemorrhage in the neurofibroma or meningioma can make the presentation acutely and put a contra coup effect, push the cord to the opposite side. So the lesion may be on the right side. So the bleed into the intradural tumor produced a contra coup effect and pushed the cord to the opposite side. So that is the second possibility. Single pathology, if you want to put single, it may be an intradural quiet lesion into which a hemorrhage occurred and it put a contra coup effect. 
and we tell that the pressure sensitive tracts are posterior column and corticospinal tract and uh, you, we say that ischemia produces involvement of the spinothalamic tracts and uh, autonomic so bladder bowel spinothalamic gets involved more more severely in vascular lesions whereas compressive lesions involve corticospinal tract and posterior columns i am sure you might have seen any number of cervical disc prolapse patient they rarely present with spinothalamic they will have spasticity and when you examine you might find some posterior column spinothalamic is the last thing that happens in cervical compressive malignancy so compression prefers posterior column and corticospinal ischemic insults like spinal artery occlusions or spinal arterial venous mal formation embolizations in the spinal arteries they all prefer the spinothalamic becomes more symptomatic autonomic becomes more symptomatic and the, uh, the so that is the way it is so you can say in the intradural compression acute uh, presentation due to a bleed and contracope effect or a tractopathy selectively picking up the corticospinal tract and that to the lateral part more than the medial part so that is uh, happening only at the lumbar level you cannot put the neck pain and correlate this because uh, this lesion did not go to the upper limb it went to the opposite lower limb only the second possibility there is something called cervical paraplegias so cervical paraplegias are again described in compressive lesions cervical canal stenosis so facing patient is already having a narrow canal a disc is coming or some degenerative osteophytes are coming because the outer fibers are the leg fibers so that is cervical paraplegia cervical paraplegia not quadriplegia so cervical paraplegia happens due to chronic canal stenosis so uh, so these are the two, uh, two things you will consider if it is lower limb right lower limb then left lower limb if the patient has told right lower limb after that i develop neck or upper limb something like that it is okay but when he says it is right lower limb then left lower limb if you want to put the pathology in the neck it has to be a chronic lesion lumbar uh, cervical canal stenosis it was going on for quite some time suddenly patient became more disabled and became aware of that that is one possibility second a tractopathy involved in the corticospinal tract in the lumbar region third is a bleed in the mass in the lumbar region with contra so why i am considering cervical as a differential diagnosis when discussing a monophoresis because this was soon followed by neck pain and on said to peak was only 10 days between the leg and the upper limb so i, I would like to put that also as a possibility a cervical paraplegia but usually cervical paraplegia is a feature of compressive lesions in canal stenosis mm -hmm. uh, so that is uh, the way it is coming then you got the upper limb which upper limb came right upper limb no he said both the upper limb started uh, together only he could not exactly remember when but he said both uh, both the upper limb weakness started uh, together upper limb you should be little more careful i am just close my door and come my daughter went out one minute then mm -hmm. In the upper limb, did the patient have any root pains? The no, cervical no. paraplegia can be a myeloradiculopathy. Radiculopathy in the upper limbs and myeloopathy below. Because of the neck pain, I am uh, I am considering uh, a single pathology or two lesions is another question you have to ask. But uh, if it if you want to put it as a single pathology, because within ten days the upper limb got involved. and if there was a root pain on the upper limb it may be myeloradiculopathy because as i said cerebral spinal paraplegia cervical paraplegia is common with canal stenosis uh, whereas other lesions other uh, acute demyelinations or other conditions present as a quadriplegia 
So if we started with paraplegia, canal stenosis is the common thing. In that case, the upper limb involvement can be element. The element will be roots. So did the patient experience a radicular type of pain in the upper limb? Or did he have an element type of weakness in the upper limb? <coughs> that will be useful, but I agree that patient may not be able to tell. So what was the type of weakness, distal or proximal in the upper limb? He got, is he able to know? Distal. He mainly complained of distal weakness. Like initially he had difficulty in mixing food. Then he started to use his uh, spoon to hold, but that also he could not. So currently he's been fed by his attenders. We asked about proximal muscle weakness. Like he could, he told that he could uh, reach out for overhead objects, but there was difficulty in holding those objects. So was the upper limb stiff or fly? He was says he stiff. 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 So maybe it is uh, torn in the lower limb and uh, power in the our upper limb, movement paralysis in the upper limb. If he felt it is stiff, it is probably uh, the upper motor involvement only. And in that case, it is the kinetic melody. So the distal muscles are getting involved. So the question now is, if there was a gap of 10 days between the lower limbs and the upper limbs, and that is really true, then uh, is the person having one lesion or two lesions? That's a very important question. It's a cervical pathology presenting as uh, paraparesis and quickly going into quadriparesis, but uh, there is a gap. That gap, keep in your mind. Uh, whether your patient is having a single lesion or two lesions. Mm -hmm. And at this point of time, it is a stiffness, so it's a cord. Uh, you didn't have any frontal lobe features, no disorientation, no frontal lobe behavior, mm -hmm. no seizures, no headache, no vomiting. Mm -hmm. So probably it is a, a spinal cord. So if you put one, one lesion or two lesion, question remains when you examine, you look for two levels of sensation and so things like that. But before that, we will say that if it is a, uh, the describing a spinal cord pathology. So it is a fairly acute. It has become quadriplegia within 10 days. Now it's come to you 25 days, but from the lower limb to upper limb was only 10 days. So it's a fairly acute problem. And it is uh, predominantly motor. Other tracks came later before we go into discussion of the sensory features, if you are thinking. So now we have to consider, describe a spinal cord problem. So is it a pan cord, anterior cord, posterior cord, hemi cord, central cord? Second, so what is the, look, okay, pan cord means one group of etiologies. Pan cord, all the tracts, spinothalamic, posterior column, corticospinal tract, spinocerebellar, all of them are getting knocked out. That is called pan cord syndrome. So, first thing we think that is a problem is in the cervical cord because of the neck pain and all. So, what are the situations where you can get a pan cord syndrome? One is demyelination. He is 72 year old person. So in this age group, the type of demyelination you are expecting is an acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Adam, Adam kind of presentation. One that can be uh, pan cord. Second cause for a pancard syndrome is a, you have got an arteria cervicalis magna. You know that anterior spinal artery supplies the whole of the cord other than posterior column. Posterior spinal artery supplies only posterior column. So classical vascular syndromes are either anterior cord or posterior cord. Pan cord occurs in two levels. One is Adam K. V. artery in the lumbar region. Lumbar spinal and cord. And arteria cervicalis magna in the cervical region. So, does he have a, considering the age of the person, is he having a vascular condition where the arteria cervicalis magna is getting affected? That is pan cord. So, my patient is not having a pan cord mm -hmm. as far as the history is there. So, it is only a selective motor tract involvement. Second, anterior cord and posterior cord, as I say, they are classical vascular syndromes where posterior column is paid and uh, or posterior column is involved. They are anterior cord and posterior cord. Then you have got a hemicord. Classically, you know, brown sequard syndromes. That is usually traumatic. 
gunshot injuries. Yes. Or rarely it can be due to tumors. In that situation, it will be subacute. It goes on over a longer period, intrinsic tumor, spinal gliomas. Spinal gliomas can present like a brown sequard syndrome, but it will be over several months. Acute or subacute kind of brown sequard syndromes are usually traumatic. So that is hemicord syndrome. Central cord syndrome, it is trauma. Hmm? So what do you get in central cord syndrome? It is something like this. Upper limbs, distal, lower limbs, whole of the lower limb gets involved. And there can be uh, dissociated anesthesia. Because of the uh, central uh, crossing spinothalamic fibers get involved, they can have distal weakness of the upper limb and the whole weakness of the lower limbs with the dissociated anesthesia and uh, that is the central cord syndrome usually happens due to whiplash injury. Supposing a person uh, travels in a bus and he gets up before, the, gets down before the bus stops, you get a dynamic injury to the spine. They are called whiplash injuries. So due to whiplash injury, you can get a central cord syndrome. But our patient is not fitting into pan cord, anterior cord, posterior cord or central cord. Our patient at this point of time is having only two tracks uh, that are partially involved. So uh, right corticospinal, left corticospinal, predominantly the outer fibers to start with. And later he involved the upper limb also. So if the upper limb is also part of a single pathology, I have to put the pathology in the cervical cord. So it's a cervical cord, selective tractopathy involving the corticospinal tract and very acute onset. So what is unique nature of the corticospinal tract? It is the most myelinated tract. So is it something to do with the myelination that is happening is the question we will ask. The second question, the second symptom you told, patient developed neck pain. So the neck pain in a, in a person with the cervical cord disease happens due to what all situations is the next question. So this his anemia is disturbing me. Whether he had a leukemia or something like that, you see, we don't know. Because uh, neck pain can be spinal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Supposing patient has got a bleeding uh, tendency due to a hematological disorder, he can have a spinal subarachnoid hemorrhage that can present like a, a meningitis with severe neck pain and restricted neck movements. So that is one cause for neck pain. So whether bleeding in the subarachnoid space is happening, that is because of your past history of unexplained anemia and a senior person. So is he having a hematological malignancy? I will seriously consider for the neck pain. Second neck pain can come from the pain sensitive structures in the neck. What are all the pain sensitive structures? It can be skin, it can be periosteum of the vertebra, intramuscular nerves, roots, and dura, and arachnoid. So dura and arachnoid get involved in pachymeningitis. Uh, then you can get leptomeningitis. You can have a root compression, and you can have uh, muscle or vertebral pathology leading to periosteal problems. They are will be. Uh, then if you go into the tracks, it can be the posterior column or the spinothalamic tract. So, so these are the locations from where a person can experience pain. So supposing it is due to skin, what conditions you get skin pain in a person? So it may be a herpes. You see, you know, herpes happens in patients who are immunologically compromised and it can produce a lesion which can be invisible and it can later present as a viral myelitis. It can be seen in the upper level. Unless you look for that, you may not uh, pick it up. So what is the explanation given for this is uh, I, uh, von Economos encasement hypothesis. You might have heard of this hypothesis. Generally, any spinal cord pathology uh, acutely happening in a immunologically compromised person due to whatever cause, not necessarily HIV, any other cause like leukemia, uh, severe anemia due to other causes, whatever may be the situation, they can get it because dorsal root ganglia. 
dorsal root ganglion is a sanctuary for the herpes virus. Uh, once you get a, a herpes infection, varicella infection, some areas are sanctuaries. So one sanctuary is the dorsal root ganglion. That is called one economos encasement hypothesis. The virus remains. I am sure you know that viruses when they enter, there is something called attachment, penetration, uncoating. See, uh, uh, virus gets attached to specific regions by their specific uh, tropism. And after they get attached, they uncoat. They remove their nucleocapsid. And then they get into the host nucleus or cytoplasm and turns off the DNA or the RNA to produce its own replication. So that is attachment, penetration, uncoating, then getting attached to the nucleic acid. So in before that uncoating happens, the viral proliferation is arrested by the host defenses. So it remains encased there. So that is one economous encasement hypothesis and it remains encased in the dorsal root ganglion. Once the immunity breakdown, this will come up, usually at the upper level of the spinal pathology. So that can be uh, infections, uh, one cause, demyelination. Uh, demyelination is the first cause being the uh, PR tractopathy. Second is the person having a, a infection which is starting at one point and then spreading. Or is it a beginning of an adder? These are the questions and the skin kind of pain. You know, the cutaneous burning pain is what you get in preherpetic neurology. So patient will have preherpetic pain. You do not know. I have seen patients who come and tell that there was a pain there. I put hot water bo uh, bottle or hot water bag and I got a scald. It will be usually the herpetic lesions. Patients think it is a scald because in the initial phase, the lesions may not be visible. So they put a hot water bag and they think it's a hot water induced blister. So that is one cause for pain coming from the skin as a pain sensitive structure. Vertebral pains due to metastasis, fractures, no? myelomas. So patient will have mechanical restriction of movement with the local tenderness. So vertebra and periosteum producing a pain like that. So vertebral disease producing a root pain. So root pain, as you know, it's a sudden shock-like pain radiating along the corresponding root with the precipitating factor and relieving factor. So precipitating factor may be coughing, sneezing, weightlifting, moving the neck, a very sudden shock-like. And if the person lies immobile, the pain goes away. That is a root pain. Then are you getting the pain from the tracks? What are the nature of the posterior column tract pain? One thing you told the Lermit sign. When the patient moves his neck, he gets a lightning-like pain. So it comes from the posterior column. So posterior column may be directly involved or indirectly involved. Posterior column pains were first described in uh, hypertrophic pachymeningitis of syphilis. But later we know that even intrinsic cord lesions involving posterior column like multiple sclerosis, all of them can present with Lermit sign. So Lermit sign, so this person's pain did not come from the skin, it did not come from the vertebra, it did not come from the root, it came from the posterior column. So posterior column was either directly involved or indirectly involved due to a cervical cord uh, outside lesion, we don't know. And other features of posterior column pain, one is larmids, second is lightning pains. Did you have lightning pains? So they are body pain, uh, across the body pains, which do not respect the uh, neural uh, anatomy. That's why we call it as visceral crisis or thoracic crisis. So somebody will imagine that my patient's iota dissected or he had an MI or perforation of a viscous. So that kind of pain which does not respect a neural pathway is lightning pain. Suddenly comes, strikes and goes. So Lermit pain, uh, Lermit sign, lightning pains. You may have band-like sensation. A tight band is put in the thoracolumbar region. 
which also comes from the posterior column. Or you may get bizarre sensory symptoms in the uh, hand and feet. The glove and stocking will be so asymmetric. In one leg, it may be up to the hip, another leg, it may be up to the angle, like that. And, uh, so the, and deep, boring paresthesia. Because posterior column gets uh, proprioceptive afferents from the muscles and the bones. So these are the five manifestations. One is Lermit sign, lightning pains, band-like sensation, bizarre glove and stocking, and deep, boring paresthesia. But in your patient, I think he had the Lermit sign, other things here not given in the history. Then uh, spinothalamic tract is a pain and temperature tract. So it is taking cutaneous information. It is not having a spindle apparent. Spindles are not carrying pain and temperature. So it will be a superficial, ill-defined, burning or cold feeling. So that is spinothalamic. So at this point of time, our patient seems to have a problem, probably at the cervical cord, whose onset to peak was about 10 days. It probably started in the outer pyramidal fibers in the cervical cord and then completely involved the whole pyramidal tract. Second, it probably involved the posterior column. So it is picking up the myelinated tracts. Uh, tracts. So whatever disease, is it having a vulnerability to prick, prick the myelin? So it's a tractopathy. It is not an anterior cord. It is not a posterior cord. It's not central cord. It's not pan cord. It's a tractopathy. And this tractopathy is fairly acute, very rapid. And it seems to involve the myelinated tracts. So the pathology may be demyelination. Supposing there is a gap in between the lumbar region and the cervical region, it is two levels. That we have to examine, then only we will know. Looking for sensory clues and the element clues. Otherwise, it can still be explained by a cervical cord disease. But only odd feature is why it started on both sides from the outer aspect. In that situation, tractopathies are uh, due to compression vulnerability. That is more common, as I told intramedullary lesion starting on one side producing a contract of compression or a cervical canal stenosis. But the odd feature for that is a very hyperacute course. Those tumors and cervical canal stenosis will have a little more subacute course. So this is say the uh, myelinated tracts are involved, but some atypical features are there where it picked up only the outer fibers. So whether the history is correct or not, we don't know. Uh, or uh, so the atypical features we will pick up and note down so that we will analyze it and we will not be surprised if you find something different. Odd features always you have to pick up and you will not have an explanation at that point of time. But after examination you will get it. Okay. So this is a cervical cord involving the myelinated tract in an acute fashion, short duration. So probably it's a demyelinating disease. Considering the age of the person, I will consider first possibility as Adam. Acute disseminated encephalomyelitis involving the spinal cord. Okay, next one. On examination, what did you find? General uh, History diagnosis for an MD student, you will call it as an incomplete cord lesion, selectively involving the myelinated tracts. That will be your history diagnosis. Okay, then. Uh, general physical examination was normal, ma'am. There was no uh, significant findings in the general physical examination. Mm. Any stigma, top malignancy, any bleeding tendency? Ma'am, nothing, uh, nothing abnormal was reported in the general physical examination. Okay. Uh, higher mental functions were normal. The patient was conscious, uh, cooperative, well-oriented to time, place, and person. Uh, in cranial nerve examination, cranial nerve 1 was normal. In cranial nerve 2, the patient had a normal visual uh, visual acuity and field of vision. The color vision was impaired on the right side, ma'am. He had uh, impairment of the red and green uh, uh, color vision. Only Is on the right side. Since birth? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Before that, he could recognize. Here, when we checked, the, uh, only on the right eye, it was, um, it was impaired, the red and green. The left side was normal. So, is he sure that it was before normal color vision? 
before that he could read and uh, watch so television we normally we don't know no because we see people um, he is a male people who have impaired color vision would never have known what is normal red or uh, like that it is like seeing a red in the darkness so so two things you have to consider acquired color blindness is it an acquired color blindness so color desaturation uh, in which part of the neuroaxis you can get acquired if it is acquired or is it previously present and the medical student never examined the patient so they he never knew it and he went on with his life you don't know if it did not demand such precise appreciation of color he would have gone on he would have never known or if it's an acquired color blindness uh, what all the possibilities optic neuritis can be because the first thing though the vision is normal impairment of color vision uh, the first thing to occur in optic neuritis so could it be in optic neuritis what happens first is a acuity because it is the papillomacular bundle optic neuritis if it is happening papillomacular bundle gets uh, affected that will be a central scotoma or a centrosecal scotoma so it will be the acuity severely impaired acuity but peripheral vision will be good whereas color desaturation is very uh, important for a retinal disease supposing you give tamitol chloroquine he has received lot of chloroquine for corona which was distributed at that time or acquired color blindness is seen with the diabetes hiv hmm? so chloroquine or ethambutol or uh, hiv and diabetes these are situations you are getting acquired color blindness so your uh, color desaturation is usually not the first feature in optic neuritis it is acuity loss so we will see what it is and uh, how to other important things are there you have supposing you have a compressive problem it is red if you have a vascular problem all colors go suppose you have got a vascular pathology involving the visual pathway all colors are involved to the same degree if you have compressive problem it is usually red more it is called by a rule called holner's rule holner's rule holner's rule says that supposing you have got a progressive red color involvement look for a compressive pathology either in the optic chasm optic tract supracellular pathways radiation so any visual pathway red color is maximum involved means it is uh, uh, compression all colors are uniformly involved means it is vascular it is blue, blue or green if it is toxins so that is called colnus rule so it is olden times when these mri and other things are not that easy uh, these are the clues by which you look for a compressive problem so is it an acquired color blindness we will keep it in our mind in that case we will carefully look at retina you see having a retinal problem in addition to optic nerve. so our field of vision is normal so did you check the field with the various colored objects or what objects not colored it's only confrontation uh, test we have done the field of vision so we have to do field of vision with the colored objects when there is a and you can see which color is most affected which color field is very strong color vision impaired and impaired in one eye you are written so and in that case uh, only one eye no light yes, reflex is present right side in direct present light reflex is present that is again not the feature of optic neuritis you see your early loss of light reflex is a feature of you have a, you you will have either marcus gun pupil or diastrite away impairment uh, of light reflex whereas color vision is impaired light reflex is preserved fundus shows pale optic disc in this case i will think it is a neuroretinitis there is a thing called neuroretinitis you got a pale disc that definitely means optic nerves are involved so what all the types of pallors you get in the optic disc so that we will see what is happening to our patient 
ಈಗ ಪ್ರೈಮರಿ ಆಪ್ಟಿಕ್ ಅಟ್ರಫಿ ಚಾಕಿ ವೈಟ್ ಸೊ ಚಾಕಿ ವೈಟ್ ಇಫ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅ ಪ್ರೈಮರಿ ಆಪ್ಟಿಕ್ ಅಟ್ರಫಿ ಇಟ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ನ್ಯೂಟ್ರಿಷನಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ಕ್ರಾನಿಕ್ ಕಂಬ್ರೆಷನ್ ಇಟ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ಟಾಕ್ಸಿಕ್ ಇಟ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ಸೀಕ್ಲಿ ಆಫ್ ಅನ್ ಓಲ್ಡ್ ಆಪ್ಟಿಕ್ ನ್ಯೂರೈಟಿಸ್ ಸಪೋಸಿಂಗ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಪೋಸ್ಟ್ ಪ್ಯಾಪಿಲಿಡೆಮಿಕ್ ಆಪ್ಟಿಕ್ ನ್ಯೂರೈಟಿಸ್ ಆಪ್ಟಿಕ್ ಅಟ್ರಫಿ ಯು ಗೆಟ್ ಅ ನೇಸಲ್ ಪ್ಯಾಲರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಅ ಡರ್ಟಿ ಪ್ಯಾಲರ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಪ್ಯಾಪಿಲೆಡಿಮ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಬೀನ್ ದೇರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪ್ಯಾಪಿಲೆಡಿಮ ರಿಸಾಲ್ವ್ಡ್ and that the dissolve dissolution produces some kind of a dirty color and the nasal part the vessels are more uh, prominent so papilledema is always more prominent on the nasal side so nasal pallor more than temporal pallor and the pallor is not chalky white it is a dirty kind of pallor and then you have got a um, uh, cup will be usually blurred whereas in primary optic atrophy the physiological cup will be very deep then you took for, uh, for another kind of consecutive optic atrophy where you get a dilute honey colored disc which we call it as a waxy pallor so if it is a retinal disease and which is producing consecutive optic atrophy it is a waxy pallor or honey colored disc or you can get a quadrantic pallor that is typically vascular one quadrant is more pale you can have a bow tie pallor vertical bow tie horizontal bow tie quadrantic pallor nasal pallor temporal pallor temporal pallor is post neuritic optic atrophy post papilledemic is nasal and blurred disc margins is post papilledemic and waxy pallor is retinal disease so in this patient the unique features are color desaturation normal pupillary reflex and slightly pale disc i will think of a neuro retinitis in the right eye left eye hyperemic so this did you measure the disc swelling yes he is a uh, hyperemic disc with everything else being normal you see whether it is a pseudo hyperemia hypermetropic disc is hyperemic looking so what uh, what all the other things you look for in the disc in that eye on the opposite eye disc swelling you should measure Mm-hmm. senior person no he may be having hypermetropia hypermetropia will produce a hyperemic appearance why i am thinking you should pick up those odd features because everything is normal people is normal color is normal everything is normal only hyperemic looking disc so whether it is a hypermetropia everything else is normal because of that reason you know, you should be careful so you measure the disc swelling when you say hyperemia you are telling there is some disswelling so you can measure the disswelling if it is more than 3 diopters it is papilledema if it is less than 3 diopters it is hyperemia and if it is normal it is normal so whether there is a swelling at all if it is a hypermetropic disc when you measure there will be no swelling it is a correctable with glasses and uh, there is no swelling so you should measure the disswelling that is usually done with ophthalmoscope you can go to a peripheral vessel and keep on adjusting your ophthalmoscopic power till you see the vessel very clearly then come back to the disc margin and adjust at what point the disc margin becomes clear and at what point you saw the vessel clear you subtract that gives the disvelly you see so you can see whether there is a real disswelling or is it only a refractory error because pupil is normal yes. everything else is normal second hyperemic disc if it is papilledema what you will look for venous pulsation so papilledema produces obliteration of venous pulsation in the retina it is the veins that pulsate not the arteries it's a passive transmission of venous pulsations through the because venous pulsation veins are large venous pulsations are visible arteries are also pulsating only but you are not able to measure the arterial pulsation you are not able to see it's not visible it is a small anga one appointment igal va appointment so you look for uh, venous pulsations venous pulsations are impaired means the hyperemia may be papilledema then you can look for patterns line around the disc you find retinal folds 
so dissolving with retinal folds and diopter more than 3 diopter swelling absent venous pulsation that hyperemic fundus becomes papilledema swelling less than 3 diopters venous pulsation normal peripapillary region normal visual acuity impaired pupil is sluggish that is optic neuritis whereas hypermetropia nothing else will be there will be false appearance of hyperemia so what is happening we need little more data on the right side probably it's a neuroretinitis okay what is the clue that you get from neuroretinitis what all conditions you get neuroretinitis one common condition is vasculitis second is paraneoplastic syndromes third is drugs and toxins no so uh, these things you keep in your autoimmune disorders because your patient they had some anemia so is there any malignancy hidden somewhere we don't know which are capable of producing neuroretinitis so we'll keep it in our mind okay then femina uh, 3 4 and 6 were normal ma'am the extraocular movements were full on both the sides there was no dosis on the stagmus uh, the trigeminal nerve uh, it was normal both the motor and the sensory component was normal uh perineal seventh is a facial nerve was normal uh, the muscles of facial expression was uh, normal the taste over the anterior two third of the tongue was normal cranial nerve eight was also uh, normal okay uh cranial nerve nine and ten the position of the ula was central uh the gag reflex was normal uh the uh, cranial nerve 11 the trapezium sternocleida mustard were normal and uh, uh the tone of the uh tone movements and power of the tongue were normal and there were no fasciculations that were seen. Okay. Uh, coming to the motor system, ma'am, the so elderly gentleman was lying comfortably in the bed. The upper limb was flexed, the position, attitude of the limb, the upper limb was flexed in the elbow, wrist and the metacarpophalangeal joint bilaterally. The lower limb was externally rotated at the hip and flexed at the knee. And there was flexor spasms that were seen uh, during examination. And there was no visible wasting uh, that was seen. The bulk so, was, the was kept flexed at the elbow. That yes, means the elbow wrist. That flexion is stronger than extension. Extension, no? extension. extension is uh, by what segment? C7. Flexion is by C5. So that is called broad bench law. It used to be called. So in a person with a cervical cord lesion, if the person is keeping the elbow flexed, it pro indicates that C5 is stronger than C7. That is called the broad bench law. Uh, the tone, both the upper limb and lower limb. Uh, probably, the, by looking at the posture, the level is around C7. Because broad bench type of posturing of the upper limb. Otherwise, flexion of the upper limb happens in what condition? Decorticate. Decorticate portion. So decorticate means what? What is that level? So, he's not decorticate because his HMS is very good mm -hmm. and he is communicating, talking, comfortable, you said. So he's not decorticate. But if it is decorticate, I said broad bench law in the cervical cord indicates the lesion is around C7. No? And uh, C5 is preserved. So C5 is pulling it in its plane. That is broad bench law. If it is a decorticate, why is the pathology? We say that the rubrospinal tract is intact. So rubrospinal tract is needed to keep the upper limb flexed and lower limb extended. So decorticate happens in a lesion which is above the red nucleus. So red nucleus is preserved. So, rubrospinal tract is producing the flexion of the upper limb and extension of the lower limb. So, it, uh, flexion of the upper limb and extension of the lower limb can be in the brain stem decorticate if the rubrospinal tract is preserved. Or it can be in the cervical cord if the pathology is sparing the C5 segment. So, that is the interpretation. Okay. Then, then you told lower limbs, fluxor spasms. What yes. does fluxor spasm indicate? Uh, Why do you get flexor spasms? Like usually, if in uh, UMN lesion, if there's paraplegia and flexion, we uh, mm -hmm. see flexor spasms, mom. Like yes. Why do you get? So now it is natural, no? When the flexor tone is more, 
paraplegia fluxion will happen no so why do you get that paraplegia fluxion the land extra pyramidal tracts will be involved very good what are those uh, extra pyramidal tracts rubro spinal tract hmm. reticular spinal hmm. so two things uh, you see you have got a uh, uh, long latency flexor reflex afferent what is the long latency flexor reflex afferent that is a cortico spinal tract and long latency extensor reflex afferent they are the dorsal reticular spinal tract so normally we have got extension we have got flexion which works uh, in a phased way so that we are able to walk when we walk one length we will have to flex another leg will have to extend this happens uh, motivated through the locomotor center in the midbrain and the spinal cord so there is a phase dependent reflex reversal flexion of one leg and extension of another leg that is mediated in the adult with a long latency flexor reflex afferent that is the cortico spinal tract and long latency extensor reflex afferent that is the dorsal reticular spinal tract but uh, during birth how are we we are in that flexion posture no universal flexion that is maintained by what spinal cord level yes what is the name of that tract short latency flexor reflex afferent that is not having any higher connection why uh, in the intrauterine life you have got two structures one is the earliest center to develop in the brain is the palm chin center the palm chin center is there in the per uh, parietal lobe that is keeping the palm and the chin approximated child is like this no so the child will have to occupy very little space inside the uterus so palm chin center is there so there is a palm chin center in the parietal loop which keeps the palm and the chin approximated like this and short latency flexor reflex afferent in the spinal cord brain stem has not myelinated so long latency extensor tone is not developed so intersegmental reflex it's an intersegmental reflex which gets suppressed when the child turns over stands and starts walking you see normally you are like this now when the child is born i'm sure you might have seen children in your gynecology ward when they are born they are like this no it, their cortex or brain stem has not myelinated still why are they like this it is because of the intersegmental reflex which is called s r a short latency flexor reflex afferent so short latency flexor reflex afferent and the palm chin center is responsible for keeping the normal intrauterine posture so if you lie down like that you cannot turn over you cannot sit you cannot walk you cannot do anything so slowly slowly the long latency flexor reflex afferent will suppress the short latency flexor reflex afferent so it becomes a phased one you put in phase the extensor tone and work in collaboration you don't any more need only flexion you need extension so extension comes to the dorsal reticular spinal tract it is the brain stem and they work in collaboration with the long latency flexor reflex afferent that is the cortico spinal tract so flexion and extension will go on so once these two tracts are cut off due to whatever pathology preservation of self and species we tell no so this is a universal flexion for preservation supposing some predator is attacking insect is attacking they crawl no the worms and all they crawl so it becomes a primitive reflex so you go into uninhibited short latency flexor reflex afferents which have been inhibited long back when you are turning over by fourth month itself short latency flexor reflex afferents are completely suppressed by the long latency flexor reflex afferents and the dorsal reticular spinal tract so whatever pathology is taking dam causing damage to these two long latency tracts will disinhibit the short latency flexor reflex afferents which are for preservation of species a primitive reflex which does not need any of your brain normally we don't like crawl down when we see an insect we will run away 
or will try to kill the insect no something like that that comes through the higher order functions to preserve one species so when all this is not connected when the spinal cord is not connected with the cognitive centers this decision does not take place so go into like that now when the child is born like that when you leave very old very old people also like that no so uh, very very old if you leave up to uh, more than 90 years slowly you go back to that posture it is because of the cog brain atrophy cognitive voluntary movements getting slowly slowly impaired and again species has to be preserved that is the ultimate goal of life to preserve so that goes into the reflex posture which does not any more need so fluxus passim indicates severe damage to the pyramidal and extra pyramidal tracts so that short latency fluxor reflex afferents are released and they are putting the patient into the reflex posture which is normally seen at birth you see so the you have got a neuroretinitis in the right eye and you have got a corticospinal tract posterior column with disinhibited short latency fluxor reflex afferents in the spinal cord that indicate a relatively bad prognosis for recovery that means there is complete suppression of spinal fluxor tone and extensor tone so that the short latency fluxor reflex afferents are released so that is the mechanism to explain the fluxor spasm clear no yes ma'am so that much severe involvement of the uh, motor tracts in the spinal cord has taken place okay then there was spasticity in both the upper limbs and lower limbs ma'am mm. uh coming to the power uh, at the shoulder joint there was slightly reduced power ma'am uh, bilaterally mm. on 4 by 5 the elbow joint and the uh, wrist joint we were not so sure about the exam uh, elbow joint was 5 by 5 ma'am the wrist joint every time we went to examine the patient went into flexion so we are not sure about the power at this uh, when there is fluxor spasm any any stimuli can elicit that uh, spasm so patient may not be able to cooperate i agree okay the hand grip was weak uh, bilaterally okay the abdominal and trunk muscles also were weak ma'am the patient could not roll over on his own and it, it, there was a lot of difficulty for him to get up also on his own so apparently it looks like a continuous lesion you don't have two lesions apparently because from the neck down everything is weak there is no two levels at least with respect to motor yes ma'am the but the low, uh, lower limbs bilaterally the power at the hip joint knee joint and ankle joint was 1 by 5 ma'am mm. so hardly any uh, movement that was seen mm. coming to the reflexes uh, the superficial reflexes corneal conjunctival reflexes were present abdominal reflex was absent bilateral plantar was extensor mm. the deep tendon reflexes uh, bilaterally the biceps and triceps were 3 plus ma'am supinator again it was difficult because he could not uh, relax the uh, muscles so it was a little difficult to assess the supinator jerk okay. the knee jerk was 3 plus bilateral ma'am ankle jerk was just elicitable it's just 1 plus and the severe, severe tendacles contracture what all situations you get to this kind of depressed ankle jerk in the presence of spasticity one there can be associated peripheral neuropathy neuropathy mild peripheral neuropathy may be there or second they might have already gone into tendacles contracture already patient is having so much of fluxor spasm so if he has gone into a contracture due to that altered tone then the angle jerk will be sluggish so that you have to examine because if there is a peripheral neuropathy the diagnostic possibilities are different if it is contracture the possibilities are different so so we will have to look for carefully look for a peripheral sensory level okay then uh the sensory system ma'am the posterior column uh, the vibration and fine touch was absent below the uh, acromion process that is below c4 it was absent the joint position sense uh, it was absent distally ma'am both the fingers and toes were a uh, bit checked so it was absent the crude mm-hmm. touch was absent below the level of c4 dermatome both pain and temperature also was absent below uh, c4 dermatome mm-hmm. 
Nita. Gate we could not assess, ma'am. Gate could not be assessed here. Okay. Not uh, make the patient. Uh, Sinus temperature is also affected on examination. Yes, ma'am. So it apparently it's a pan cot. Only thing the bladder fibers whether they are involved at this point of time we do not know because he has been catheterized. Maybe that is involved. How will you know whether the bladder is involved? We tell that. Many okay. times they are very early catheterized. So we may not know. We can pull at the catheter and elicit the bulbocavernous reflex. You mm -hmm. see? So, and see whether that reflex is brisk or no, it's absent. That will point us to know whether it is an upper motor or lower motor involvement is there or not. Bubble, how is the bubble? Bubble, he, he now he is able to, ma'am, like he is able to tell that he is uh, able, I mean, he needs, he has the urge to pass motion and all. He has no complaints with that. Okay. Or maybe the autonomic fibers are not that much involved. That we can. He never had any blood symptoms or hesitancy, precipitance, nothing. No, ma'am. Like, uh, what happened was initially when he had the lower limb symptoms only, he got, uh, like, uh, as he had the lower limb symptoms, he got hospitalized. At that moment only, because he had difficulty in uh, uh, walking, he was catheterized. So, we are not sure whether he had any bladder uh, symptoms later on. Okay. Um, there was no nystagmus, so there was no titubation, ma'am. The heel niche or shin, I mean, heel, heel shin test or the finger nose test could not be done. There were no signs of any meningeal irritation. The skull and the spine were normal. There was no spine tenderness or any abnormality that was seen. So after examining, uh, after examination, what do you feel? You are more enlightened with what additional points? Apparently, it's a pan cord. Yes, ma'am. All the tracks are involved with the, about the bladder. We are not sure. Yes. So you can look for sweating, uh, any uh, hypotension, all those things. If possible, we can elicit. But uh, he, he needs a lot of support to make him stand and look for partial hypotension. Even otherwise, fully paralyzed persons can have. So you can look for any level with the sweating is there. That will be an indirect clue for us to know whether autonomic involvement is there. And as he told, you can try eliciting the bulbocavernous reflex. Uh, that is uh, with reference to autonomy. So it's apparently a pan cord, and the level seems to be at uh, apparently at C4 level. Mm -hmm. So what is special for the C4 level? And he has another lesion which is disseminated away from the cord, that is the optic nerve. So it, uh, the optic nerve, it looks like a neuroretinitis. Uh, because of the color desaturation, normal pupil and uh, pale disc. So it is predominantly retina uh, with some degree of optic nerve. Because you did not even get a Marcus Gunn phenomena, nothing you got. So it is uh, very difficult to call it as optic neuritis. So optic pallor, optic disc pallor with color desaturation. So retinal involvement. The two lesions are probably there. Are they time locked or are one is old and one is new also? We don't know. So what are all the possibilities? So after examination, you find that it is a pan cord and there is a single level and the level is in the cervical cord. So is it compressive or non congruent What is NAPE means what? Diagnosis. Um, no, neuro, uh, neuro deficit, anatomical localization, pathological and uh, etiology. Oh, I like that. Huh? So this is uh, your term you use, huh? Okay, okay. So tell me all those uh, names. <laughs> I am hearing this. So deficit in this case is spastic quadriparesis hmm. with the uh, loss of all the sensory modalities below the level of uh, C4. Yes. Uh, so deficit, anatomical, cervical cord, motor, sensory, all C4. Pathological non compressive etiology. So, what is your etiology? I agree, non compressive. Well, well, how to differentiate compressive from non compressive? Uh, ma'am, like in this case, ma'am, I had a doubt because the uh, uh, lower limb symptom with uh, compared to the other one started two to three day days later. Should we still consider it as symmetric onset or asymmetric, ma'am? Two to three days. Uh... Two to three days, you can call it as symmetrical only. 
See, at that point, if you have seen this person, when he had only one leg weakness, for you he is monoparesis. So for, just for discussion sake, I discuss. But two or three days it becomes bilateral. It may uh, it does not mean it is asymmetric. Few days it can be considered symmetrical only. But supposing he presented to you with monoparesis, what would you do? Thought. So that is what we discuss. So this looks like fairly symmetrical, very few days of difference, and that how carefully they observe, we don't know. And uh, so those things are there. So it, this can be called symmetrical only. But uh, uh, so you tell me what are all the possibilities you are considering in this patient? Um, could it still be demyelination, ma'am? Like long syndrome. So it is. Uh, it it has to be a demyelination. And what will be the what are all the odd features in this case? He seems to have a neuroretinitis rather than optic neuritis. Very clear. Is his spine, uh, spinal cord demyelinations can be acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, where you can have only spinal cord, brain, or all can be involved. But the term used is Adam, spinal form of Adam. Second, are you dealing with other demyelinations like multiple sclerosis, NMO? All those questions we will try to answer now. No, why we will consider what you will consider. Third, you are having a uh, retinal involvement probably with the secondary involvement of the optic nerve. So that uh, also seen in, not typically seen in uh, primary demyelinating disorder. So supposing we think of, this looks like demyelination, we have started with the myelinated tracts. And then completion of pathology, it involved the less myelinated tracts. That is what it looks like. From the history, it looks like it picked up the myelinated tracts. So it has to be demyelination. Started with the large myelinated tracts. So supposing I tell this is late onset MS, what you will see? One thing, there is a condition called late onset MS. When it happens beyond the age of 50, it is called late onset MS and it has got a very poor prognosis. But that you will consider if you find disseminated classical MS lesions when you are imagining the imaging Dawson's fingers, multiple small uh, lesions, uh, spread over, silent lesions. So that's an exclusion diagnosis. Late onset MS is a very exclusion diagnosis. That if it is involving the optic nerve and the spinal cord, you call it as a spino-optic MS. Typically seen in Asian patients, younger age group, females. So younger female, second decade or so. And the optic nerve is classical optic neuritis. It is not that the people will be normal and the, uh, not even Marcus Gunn phenomena, acuity is normal. Some color desaturation you find, slight pallor, no. And it is usually one eye, that is, that is okay. So MS, young, uh, spinal optic MS, is a, called Asian form of MS, young female, patchy lesions radiologically, one eye can be involved more than the other eye, and it is optic nerve, not retina, pupil and acuity will be impaired. Third, you can think of an NMO spectrum disorder. Why you should differentiate from a MS and NMO spectrum disorder? Again, that is little later. NMO can happen little later than MS not in the second decade or late first decade uh, like that, or juvenile MS is also there. NMO comes usually in the third or fourth decade. Uh, that, uh, uh, that is one. Second, you should recognize, and it involves both optic nerve uh, more than single nerve. So both optic nerve involvement is more common, usually fourth decade, and they can uh, present with long segment spinal cord involvement, and uh, the importance and, uh, of knowing is interferons and glatiramate, none of those drugs work in NMO. So if you call NMO as spinoptic MS and treat with interferons, patient will lose money and he will not improve. So that is the relevance one. As I told, NMO is usually fourth decade, both optic nerve. Imaging, you see long segment lesions. And in the optic nerve also, you will find long segment lesions. And uh, you, they can have area post or midbrain involvement. And it does not respond to interferons. And it is the spinal cord gray matter. Unlike MS, which is a disease of the white matter. 
so it is periventricular gray it will start and then it involves the white tract so nmo radiologically the lesions will be more in the periventricular region and the, and then only it becomes pan cord so it's a periventricular gray matter uh, more involved than the white matter long segment cord lesions bilateral optic nerve and uh, younger age group so and nmo also it's not fitting ms also it is uh, late onset ms also clinically i will not consider because people and all is normal one eye is okay but people is all right acuity is okay late onset ms is an exclusion diagnosis so considering the anemia apparent neuroretinitis and an adam like spinal cord in an elderly person i will always like to consider a paraneoplastic demyelination as my first possibility in this patient because of this atypical features it is on late onset ms will be a exclusion diagnosis and it of course mri criteria are there are you seeing patchy lesions in the cord and uh, dorsal fingers in the brain and uh, retina not involved it is optic nerve and oligoclonal bands are positive so like that uh, by excluding other conditions but anemia needing blood transfusion very late onset and starting uh, partial cord syndrome and apparently neuroretinitis one eye it my first diagnosis will be a paraneoplastic demyelinating syndrome uh, where you get neuroretinitis retinal involvement is typically described in paraneoplastic syndromes retinopathies no uh, very typically described in paraneoplastic syndrome so it is an adam like picture with uh, neuroretinitis that is my first diagnosis the probable etiology i will consider i will look for an occult malignancy and if that is excluded other possibilities with odd features i will consider okay so show me the investigations now another point i wanted to tell you about c4 is c4 can be a false level due to cranial it's a long segment lesion very long segment i think uh, hyper intensity is are seen from around uh, c2 throughout the cord and when you see the axial cuts uh, it is still showing some uh, in some regions it appears partial but uh, rest of the region it is pan cord okay vertebra appears normal why do, why should you look at the vertebra in a patient with uh, quadriplegia supposing it is an arteria cervicalis magna no usually that artery also supplies the vertebra so if you find vertebral infarctions along with the spinal cord signal changes you can think of a vascular problem so that's a clue vertebra plus cord so vertebral ischemia plus cord ischemia will indicate a uh, arterial uh, condition so this is uh, digital cuts i am mm. not finding any lytic lesion in the vertebra that cord shadow is stopping around d4 i think no d2 d3 d4 c2 c3 c4 c5 c6 c7 1 2 3 4 up to d4 it is there some degenerative changes are there in the cervical cord that is expected in this age group but it's not a lytic lesion okay then Okay, other systemic examinations all normal, ah? Huh? Ultrasound, abdomen, X-ray, chest, are they all normal? Yes, ma'am. What is this? Ah, uh, and I'm facing a negative disease. Negative. Negative. Okay. So, all time is all negative, or anything is positive? Oh, positive. 
uh, and um, because of the demyelinating uh, pattern, NMO was also sent, ma'am. Mm. And aquaporin 4 was positive. Mm. MOG was negative. You see, this is an odd feature. Yeah, long segment cord lesion is okay. Uh, age group and the fundus findings are not typical. You see. Uh, so, only thing, it is a it may maybe you can call it as a spectrum because initially when this acoporin antibodies were introduced they were considered very very specific now we know that it is not that specific it is seen in a wide group of conditions only thing you are not going this looks like a monophasic illness so i will consider i will not call it as an nmo spectrum disorder because uh, what uh, what neurology uh, most neurologists will insist that laboratory should be only an adjuvant to the clinical picture. So clinical picture, how are you going to explain his anemia needing blood transfusion long after his pile surgery is over six years ago and he is having a myelinated tract involvement. His age group is 72 and he has a unilateral line, whereas NMO you get bilateral line. And you have got a retinal problem uh, that is evidenced by the normal pupil, color desaturation. Slightly pale disc is the only evidence for an optic nerve. You are not having a classical optic neuritis. Classical optic neuritis is acuity loss with syndrocecal scotoma. And NMO, it will be bilateral. All these odd features, a postgraduate, we will pick it up. Then only we will learn. You see, we should not blindly believe even Charaga in the 3000 BC or 300 BC. He has said blindly, do not believe anything. So you are a postgraduate. We will pick up all the odd features. My patient had anemia, which needed four units of blood transmission means with severe anemia. And second, it started with the, uh, at the age of 72 and unilateral eye. That is not optic nerve also. So just because one antibody is positive, it is not a typical uh, NMO. It is not at all a typical. So you will keep it. You will say that I will put it into the spectrum because the antibodies are now seen in wide variety of conditions, not specifically the uh, classical NMO that was described. The classical Devix disease. I will not consider that's a female dominant disease. Fourth decade. Mm -hmm. It can involve midbrain area, post trauma, and uh, bilateral optic nerve. So, okay, this is positive. That's okay. But clinically, you will not uh, discuss like that. And uh, it will, uh, if at all that antibody positive is true and not false positive, you can put it as a spectrum, not a classical enema at all. I will still look for, uh, even though your antibodies are negative, for neoplastic workup, I will still keep a watch and look for a coming up malignancy. Okay. So you are putting him on steroids, huh? Yes, How are you going to give We give us uh, pulse. So given a, don't give oral steroid. No, give a pulse. Give a pulse and uh, ambulate him. Let me do good physiotherapy. Plexaspasms, you can, if the limb is still spastic, you can try some antispasticity agents because he started with spasticity. And keep a close watch, whole body pet, if you can afford, you can do blood smears, myeloma band, you no? Know? All those things, uh, I think you should. Do. I will not call it as a classical enema at all. All no. these odd features, I always tell, no? Hard signs, soft signs, and odd signs. Hard signs are cervical cord lesion is there. That is the hardest thing. And so it right. happened at the age of 72. That's also a hard thing. It never happened before. No? Whereas soft sign is the eye and the NMO antibody. Soft sign is eye and the NMO antibody. And the odd feature, why is the eye uh, showing normal pupil, normal acuity? And slight pallor of the disc and color desaturation. So not feature. So retina is involved. So retino, retinal involvement is a typical feature of neoplasm. 
and why did my patient have anemia not same body only no all these are odd features for a classical case so you will keep on asking that question and looking for answers the answer may not come up immediately maybe sometimes it will take one year also even as late as one year you might discover a neoplasm hmm? so that is what electrophysiology in this case is not that relevant you have found the conduction velocities are normal so because it is an upper motor neuron lesion you are not expecting anything okay then yes ma'am Ma'am, we have a doubt, ma'am. Like, is it possible that the patient can have uh, intact uh, temperature but uh, loss of pain sensation, ma'am? Like, because it's carried by the same tract. Like, it does it? happen in certain uh, specific situations where the temperature fiber alone gets involved, especially in the peripheral, in uh, some uh, infections like Hansen's disease, where the temperature fiber is the one which gets affected first. Or partial tract lesions. His pain is preserved. Huh? Only temperature is improved. No, ma'am. Uh, uh, initially, when we checked, uh, he did not respond. One, but later, when we rechecked, his uh, temperature was preserved. Pain was uh, uh, absent. Temperature cold and hot. What degree difference you checked? Hot, we checked, ma'am. Uh, he could. Uh, uh, he could. Uh, I mean, he was able to appreciate the hot uh, temperature. He could make out a hot temperature. Yeah, like, uh, I'm sure you know that his pain and temperature was the last one to get involved. Yes. So it may be a gradation. If you have not put that classical seven degrees above the room temperature and seven degrees below the room temperature to check the cold and the warmth, maybe it is too hot and he would have appreciated. The degree of appreciation may matter because that's the last one got involved. It's a demyelinated. My demyelination and the myelinated tracts were the ones which were involved initially and partial involvement of the spinothalamic tract. So unless you check the exactly with seven degrees difference or you find out the gradation. At some grade, he is not appreciating heat also. If you just put some hot water whose temperature we are not knowing, at that temperature you would have appreciated, that's all. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Any other question? Good, it's a good case. But I always tell, no, yeah, when we are students, we will try to pick up the, so always put hard features, soft features, odd features. Hard features you take for localizing and diagnosing. Soft features can be fitted into any diagnosis. So soft, soft signs you will set aside. You will not make a diagnosis with the soft features. Odd features will give you novel diagnosis. That novel thought process may have to wait in a transverse plane at a cross-sectional time. You may not get the clue, uh, but keep watching. Keep following the patient. Ma'am, I had one question, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, does demyelination usually initially cause selective tract involvement followed by Pancord syndrome? Or can it present itself with Pancord syndrome? No, no. You see, demyelinations usually start with the uh, myelinated tracts only. That is the clue for demyelinations and compressions start with the myelinated tracts, but the duration, onset to peak may be very short sometimes. Onset to peak may be sometimes okay. one day. Then you may not be able to examine at that point. And whereas vascular lesions involve the small myelinated fibers like pain and temperature first. And, and autonomic fibers. Pain and temperature and autonomic fibers become symptomatic first with burning paresthesia, bladder involvement, and then the myelinated fibers. Every, when the lesion becomes complete, everything will be involved in everything. What heralded the process is the one which gives the clue. So compression and demyelination involve the large myelinated fibers first. But onset to peak time gives you the time to examine at that point of time. Whereas vascular lesions will be autonomic and small myelinated fibers before it becomes complete. Whereas toxins are mainly small myelinated, toxic myelopathies. That will be small myelinated fibers pairing the autonomic. So small myelinated with autonomic is vascular. Small myelinated pairing the autonomic is uh, toxins. 
whereas large myelinated is demyelination or compression that will be heroding but the onset to pick gives you the time to examine at that point of time thank you ma'am ma'am i had just one more question ma'am i mean uh, central cord lesion you said there is a predominantly um, a complete weakness of the lower limb and distal weakness of the upper limb and can you explain why there is distal weakness of the upper limb because it is the lower motor neuron you see you have got a whiplash injury sulco commissural arteries get involved in that so central cord necros crossing spinothalamic fibers and the ventral horn fibers get involved so there is a distal element weakness and there can be a dissociated anesthesia distally okay thank you ma'am any other question ma'am thank you is a good case and good presentation good ma'am thank you no other questions ma'am youtube as well